Oasis on this seventh day of uh, November 2019. Hi, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload just for you. This is a uh, couple of days, what, two days after the 2019 elections. Yes, there were a lot of municipal elections going on, not just in Minnesota, but across the country. A lot of important things happened. But before we get on to our election coverage, we're just going to put together a few things. Just give you a little context as to what the, you're going to hear the media narrative, and then we're going to show you why the media narrative is wrong. And we're going to show some proof. But before we get into that, there's um, something that's been, you, you know, if you're, especially if you're watching this in the city of St. Paul, there is something that, even though it didn't appear in the election results, there's been some stuff that's been going on that you just need to be aware of. I'm sure you probably already are, but we, we got two stories back to back from CARE 11 that we're going to highlight. Uh, and I, I bring this up because in the first story, I was actually near the area where this happened, where both of these happened. Uh, I had nothing to do with either of these incidents, but there were two shootings in St. Paul on Wednesday. And I normally don't go to the downtown area of St. Paul. Um, I don't, I used to live in West St. Paul and I was actually in the West St. Paul area, and instead of coming back through Highway 52 and then, uh, you know, to get into the um, St. Paul suburbs, uh, taking the highway during rush hour, I decided to go up Robert Street and then cut over in some of the St. Paul streets. And I was near the areas where both of these incidents occurred, not too long, uh, I think I was through there before they happened, but nonetheless. This one gets to me a little bit because it's a little too close to home. But there were two new shootings in St. Paul on Wednesday. Here's the CARE 11 story on it. As a matter of fact, let's just show both of these together because the, other, the, the uh, second story is actually um, kind of led into at the very end of the first. So we're going to play both of these sequences together back to back to discuss what's going on in St. Paul as far as the uh, number of homicides and how it's impacting the citizens and the department. Another violent night in St. Paul where police officers are already stretched thin. We are following two shootings happening just minutes apart. The first at a home on the west side of the city. Then about 30 minutes later and three miles away, a different shooting at a gas station near CHS Field. We have team coverage of both these developing stories. We start tonight with Danny Spiewak. Well, in just the last hour, we have confirmed that it was a deputy U.S. Marshal who was involved in this shooting at the St. Paul gas station, a holiday station just overlooking I-94 just east of downtown. The BCA is in charge of this investigation and is leading things. You can see there are still some officers on scene looking through some evidence in a car and picking up and looking at some of the shell casings that you can see when we zoom in, seeing some of the video we were able to, to take. Now, up close, you can see several of those shell casings indicating that multiple shots were fired. But the BCA says nobody died and no officers are hurt. They've released no other information, however, and it remains entirely unclear how a federal law enforcement officer became involved in a shooting here at this gas station. The U.S. Marshals Service spokesperson based in Arlington, Virginia, says that the agency is acknowledging this, is aware of this, and they will cooperate with the BCA fully as their investigation progresses. Back to you, Randy. All right, thank you very much, Danny. Now we're going to go to the scene of the second shooting, this one involving children. Kent Erdahl is there. Randy, police tell us that the initial call that brought them here this afternoon at 3.30 in the afternoon, in fact, involved a teen male that had been reportedly shot accidentally inside the home. When we arrived about an hour after that call, police were doing their best to console family members in the yard. They tell us that teen male died inside the house. At least two other teens were also inside at the time, and that's where police are focused tonight. There were people inside the home, so we believe there's people who were there who know what happened. We did bring people to headquarters for interviews, so they're still here. They're talking to our homicide investigators. Um, I wouldn't say they were put under arrest. Now, while that briefing was going on, the forensic team was arriving back here to also collect evidence in what is now the 28th homicide of the year in St. Paul. And Randy, even though they d did report that this was initially called in as an accidental shooting, they said tonight it's simply too early in the investigation to confirm that. Certainly a tragedy. Thank you, Ken. 
With tonight's violence, as Kent mentioned, there are now 28 homicides in St. Paul this year. So many lives lost and so many murder cases to solve. And that is taking a toll on the St. Paul Police Department. Police Chief Todd Axtell shared new numbers with us today. Each investigation costs between $25,000 to $30,000 in overtime alone. In fact, it's forced the department to move officers from other units to help. So where is this money coming from? The department says they're actually about a million dollars under budget overall, thanks to savings in other areas like retirements. We have an interactive map on care11.com if you'd like more information on any of these cases. All right. This was the scene Saturday evening of St. Paul's latest homicide, the 27th this year. This has been an incredibly unusual year. Not just unusual, record breaking. Of those 27 homicides, St. Paul police say 24 have involved guns. Before this year, the highest number of gun related homicides was in 92 and 95 when there were 18. In my 30 years of uh, serving in the St. Paul Police Department, I've not seen this level of gun related homicides in our city's, city's history. Chief Todd Axtell says more than half of those homicides have been gang related. When asked why it's been such a violent year, he said this. Is there are more guns in the hands of people who shouldn't have the guns and they're using the guns to settle disputes. Axtell says the violence has prompted them to move officers from other units to help with homicide investigations, including moving a full-time employee from narcotics to focus on testing DNA on the guns recovered at crime scenes. That is the biggest issue if we can address those who are using guns illegally in this city, and which is why the DNA processing is so important. And then there's the overtime cost. The department says it costs between $25,000 to $30,000 in overtime alone to investigate each homicide. It's a huge drain on our resources. It's a huge drain financially. Money they hope will lead to a safer St. Paul. And I really believe we're going to come out of this cycle and uh, have better days ahead in St. Paul. While the department says they are way over what they budgeted for overtime this year, they're still under budget overall by about a million dollars because of savings in other areas, including salaries with people retiring. By the way, we should mention that the department says they've made arrests in 14 of the 27 homicide cases. We sure hope he's right that we're about to come out of this cycle. Yeah. That'd be good news. Thank you, Jennifer. So that's what we have it uh, as far as what's going on in the news cycle. The crime in the city of St. Paul really did not impact the elections. You would think that high crime would actually have an impact on the city council races. They did not. As a matter of fact, uh, there's another issue that uh, we're going to talk to talk about in just a little bit. And that actually had more of an impact on the city races than high crime, which surprised me. I really thought that people would be going to the bowls because they're tired of crime. It's usually how it's been in the past, but not anymore, I guess. Anyhow, we're going to move on over to our Prager University segment. Uh, we're going to talk about public pensions, how it's an economic time bomb. This is going to be one of those uh, clips, one of those sequences that are actually going to be appearing later on in the show. So watch this closely and we're going to show you or, or talk about uh, this issue a little bit more a little bit later in the broadcast. I want to talk to you about three words that should scare the heck out of you, especially if you're young. Public pension liabilities. Okay, I know you probably have about a hundred things you're worried about, and public pension liabilities likely aren't one of them. But that's the reason this is so scary, because almost no one is paying attention. Unless you're okay with your city going full Detroit and giving more of your hard-earned money to pay off someone else's debts, stay with me. So what is a public pension liability? A pension is a guaranteed lifetime payment to someone after they retire. Pensions used to be a big deal in the private sector. Every major American company had them, but they became too expensive and companies have taken steps to phase them out. However, pensions still live on in the public sector among employees of the government and they're eating city and state's budgets alive. More and more money that could go to tax cuts or better services is instead being shoveled aside to pay for these benefits. Why is this happening? Over decades, politicians have promised trillions of dollars in pensions to government workers. That includes police, firefighters, teachers, and city and state officials. You name a government job, 
and there's a pension associated with it. Now, you may be wondering, how big are these payments? Many pensions are quite large. In California, more than 62,000 retired public employees are receiving pensions of over $100,000 per year. Sometimes it's even crazier. A retired New York City sanitation worker is getting $285,000 per year. A retired county administrator in California receives over $400,000 per year. Remember, these are guaranteed lifetime yearly payouts. Now, we love our public employees. They do vital work for our local communities and the wider society. They deserve competitive pay and retirement benefits. But currently, many cities are, in effect, paying for multiple public departments at the same time. The department that's working now, and because people are living longer, a generation or two of retirees. The system amounts to a self-perpetuating, corrupt merry-go-round. Public sector unions give large donations to candidates, who are then responsible for negotiating how much of your money goes to public sector workers. These arrangements not only promise high salaries in the short term, but they also hide the payments that will be due down the road when it will be much too late. The results are predictable. State and local governments across the U.S. openly admit to $1.4 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities, or $11,000 per household. Unfunded means dollars that have been promised, but there's no actual money in the bank. And that's just the amount they admit to. The real number, according to the Federal Reserve, is much larger around $4 trillion, or $32,000 per household. Pensions have already thrown California cities like San Bernardino and Vallejo into bankruptcy, and the entire state of Illinois is teetering on the edge. So how do politicians get away with this? They use a time-tested political strategy. They lie. They lie by saying they can pay for more and more generous pensions, not by collecting more taxes, but by making investments at a guaranteed 7.5% return. But this is nonsense. It's less and less likely they'll meet their 7.5% goal over time. And their investment behavior, pouring ever more funds into ever riskier investments, suggests they know it. But if they were to use a more realistic assessment, they'd need to raise taxes dramatically. And they love their jobs too much for that. We can, however, turn the odds in our favor with public pressure, discipline, and common sense. Here's what needs to happen. First, we need state and local governments to report unfunded liabilities honestly. The real numbers, using the 2 to 3% yields that sound financial reporting would require. No more pie-in-the-sky stuff. The truth should shock voters into demanding action. Second, we must phase out the guaranteed pension programs as quickly as possible and introduce 401k plans. 401k plans, if designed properly, can provide excellent retirement benefits. These plans also have the advantage of being portable. If you leave the public sector and go work in the private sector, you get to take your money with you. In other words, you don't have to be locked in to a lifetime government job to receive retirement benefits. Win-win. Let's end the current structure of public sector pensions and move to a sustainable way of compensating our public workforce. Save your city, save your state, save your money. I'm Joshua Rao, professor of finance at Stanford and senior fellow at the Hoover Institute. And there we have it, except I wasn't quite ready when we had the camera uh, flip back, that was me. Sorry about that. Um, nonetheless, uh, that is your uh, um, Prager University segment of the day. Um, it is definitely something to watch for. Now, I will have to say that the para program with um, the pensions in Minnesota has actually been managed pretty well. So when it comes to the elections, this is not geared towards Minnesota per se. It could be. It could be a major problem with that. So far they seem to be managed very well. Uh, but we're going to come back to pensions in just a few minutes. In the meantime, we're going to take a look right now at uh, something we've actually discussed many times before, uh, although not quite like this, and that is uh, plastic bags. Where do the plastic bags in, in the uh, take-back centers go? 
We've discussed plastics to oil recycling, other forms of recycling, uh, episodes past. We have you know, extensive archives. You can go to YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash or you can go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash and you can look at a lot of our uh, back episodes featuring some more on the recycling end. But this one is a local driven story about like going to Cub Foods and you see the recycling, you recycle your plastic bags here and there's a container and you put your bag of bags inside the container. Where do those bags go? And that's what uh, WCCO actually asked uh, the other day, or actually on uh, Halloween. Uh, they asked the question, where do these plastic bags go once you drop them off? And so let's take a look at this for the answer. From the grocery store to big box retailers, we use tens of billions of plastic shopping bags each year. Most end up in landfills, but stores like Target and Walmart offer to take them back. And that had Max from New Hope and Julie from Bemidji wanting to know, where do the plastic bags go? Good question. Heather Brown followed the trail with Cub Foods. I love digging through trash. <laughs> what do we have in here? Just inside the entrances of all cubs. Dry cleaning bags, uh, bread bags. Wrap around your water bottles. Is a place to return your flimsy plastic. The ones with numbers two and four. And it doesn't matter what color they are. You will also take bags from other retailers. Yes. Okay. Oh, and here's a Star Tribune newspaper bag. <laughs> they have to be clean and dry. This is four days worth for Sarah Kreps. That's better than just going in the trash. And it's much better than going into your curbside recycling. Please, please don't do that. Unfortunately, it's a contaminant, and what they do is they cog up the conveyor lines. Becky Richard is UNFI's manager of waste and recycling. Once you put this plastic in here, where does it go? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> I thought so. It's collected from each store, along with all the other flimsy plastic, then trucked to a distribution center in Hopkins. UNFI takes in the Jerry's, Lunds and Byerly's, and Kowalski's plastic, too. About once a week, 38,000 pounds of plastic is sold and trucked to a company in Virginia. We're the largest recycler of plastic, scrap plastic film. Trex, which is known for their decks, buys it. It's the behemoth in this kind of plastic resale market. Film is challenging to recycle because mm -hmm. it's different. Recycling film is like taking a box of 64 colored, different colored crayons, <laughs> getting them all mixed up, and then trying to separate them out for somebody that wants the magenta color or the <laughs> sky blue. They shred and chop the plastic. And we'll take it from the size of, say, a bag down to the size of about a pea. Combine it with sawdust, then heat it, press it, and turn it into composite lumber. A 500 square foot Trex deck uses about 140,000 plastic bags. The bag recycling container at Cub is made of Trex material too. Financially, it makes Correct. sense. Yeah, and environmentally, it's the right thing to do. We don't want to put the plastic in the ground and in the oceans. Heather Brown, WCCO 4 News. Everyone, Heather Talk would stress using fewer plastic bags. Reuse them and be sure to recycle them in the right places. I'm going to completely discount the whole Amelia Santanello claim about using fewer plastic bags because 20 years ago it was the Amelia Santanellos of the world that were telling us to use plastic bags because we don't want to cut down so many trees, which was actually a renewable resource. And so I'm not going to get into the politics of whether or not we should use plastic bags or not, nor am I going to accept using fewer plastic bags as an excuse on you know, the clip. So that's why I want to make that quick disclaimer. But that brings us into a transition point. Why is plastic bags and recycling and trash an issue? That was the central issue in the City of St. Paul elections. What is going to happen with the trash? The central collection, uh, trash ordinance, contracts, it's a big issue. Keep in mind, this is the same issue that about seven to ten years ago the City of Maplewood was dealing with. Then the City of Bloomington was dealing with. Trash, trash ordinances are major issues in the cities, pure and simple. They've gone to court. The no side, the yes side, everybody goes to court over things. And not to say that they shouldn't have their dispute in court, but in this case, the court said, hey, you know what? We're going to put this up to a vote of the citizens. So we're not going to let you have your ordinance but this, uh, quite yet, but we're not going to have you cancel contracts. We're going to make sure that the citizens have a right to vote as to whether or not they want to keep the ordinance. So it was on the ballot. That's what drives people to the polls in the city of St. Paul. So 
Here we have it, the trash ordinance, and this is WCCO reporting again, trash ordinance being a major issue in the city of St. Paul's election. Let's take a look. Well, you know, I'm at the Wellstone Center uh, on the old west side of St. Paul, and they say uh, things have been really brisk here today, turnout-wise. And you know what's driving that is the, the controversial trash issue, as you mentioned. People who wanted a chance to vote on this finally got a chance to do just that. The big question in the capital city, vote yes or vote no? A no vote would scrap the unified trash hauling ordinance the city put in place a year ago, which divided the town into zones served by six trash haulers under contract to the city. And then you have people living on a fixed income that have been told how great this for, is for them, even though they may not have had to pay for trash before because they couldn't afford it or they were sharing. And we've heard lots of stories like that. Tom Goldstein of the Vote No campaign says it's not just that people are paying more than they did in the old system, it's about what they're not getting compared to Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, 52 bulky items get picked up a year. In St. Paul, a maximum of two, and you have to call ahead. They have carbs, they pick up yard waste, they pick up organics. We get none of those things in St. Paul. We don't make those changes by, by just repealing the ordinance. We're not voting on the contract today, we're voting on the ordinance. Javi Murillo of the Vote Yes campaign says that St. Paul took a big step toward cutting emissions by going to unified hauling, fewer trucks, fewer trips, but he points out the program's just getting started. It has kinks to be uh, resolved, but we, you know, we, we know that we need to resolve them by moving forward, not revisiting and, and just uh, doing away with the ordinance that created it. Voters turned out at a steady pace. They're also deciding on city council races, including incumbents who voted for the garbage system that are in the hot seat. I'm hopeful that we can move forward beyond today. You know, I've, I've shared that the city uh, has a basic responsibility to ensure hauling will continue and hauling will continue uh, uninterrupted, uh, however folks vote today. It's true, hauling will continue. The question will be who pays? If the vote no people win, there's a good chance that the cost will then be transferred from just the trash customers, 73,000 people, and to the entire tax base at large, the property tax base at large, because the Supreme Court said essentially the city can't break its contract with those haulers even if the voters throw out the ordinance today. Back to you. All right, lots of interest in that story. We'll definitely have updates. Thank you, John. It's a complicated issue, but there is one question I have. What is the right of a company to actually do business in a city? So if you have five trash haulers, don't they have the right to solicit for their own company, uh, for their own customers? Can they grow their own business, or is city got to be? Does the city have to be that much of a socialist, communist entity where they decide that they're going to dict dictate the terms that everybody else has to agree with? They're the ones who have to uh, make the decisions and contracts on price, and you get no say in the matter. And if you don't like the trash hauler, you do not have the power to change it. It's kind of what this whole thing comes down to. You know, the whole roads things and who pays for it. That's kind of the surface questioning. Deep down inside, it becomes a question of who has the right and who has the responsibility of making sure, the, you know, in a free marketplace. And it does not allow the trash haulers to compete for your business. It's so really what it comes down to. City says, we're going to, let's say, you know, seven wards in the city of St. Paul. So, oh, we're going to have seven trash haulers. Each of them get a ward. And here we'll throw the dice and we'll make a contract with each of them for one ward. There we go. Case closed. And if you happen to live in one of those wards and you don't like your trash hauler, you don't like it. Hey, what happens if one of the trash haulers decides to buy another one? Then we start getting into monopolies. Oh, but monopolies are bad things, except when government creates them, right? Just things to think about. I'm not saying there's a, a solid answer here. Just there are much deeper questions and much deeper issues than what they have on the uh, WCCO and CARE 11 reports. Um, speaking of CARE 11, now how active were the voters when they went to the polls on Tuesday? Let's find out from CARE 11. 
Yeah, absolutely, Gia. Hi there. I am at the Jimmy Lee Rec Center, which typically on election days gets very busy here. But you know, across the state, polling places will be quite busy because there's a lot of municipal elections today and 35 school districts have bonding referendums. So it's a big day for schools as well. Now here in St. Paul, they're trying to work out this contentious issue over trash pickup and who pays for it. So I'm going to break down this referendum for you. If you vote yes on the referendum, individual residents or property owners will still pay the bill. If you vote no, the financial obligation may be shifted to all property taxpayers in St. Paul because if the city pays for this service, they'd have to raise the property tax levy. No matter how you vote on this referendum, though, trash will still be picked up by the same haulers. Now, a lot of the polling places open at 7 o'clock this morning and close at 8 o'clock tonight, but they don't have to open at 7 a.m. So before you head out today, make sure you uh, check what time yours opens, guys. Good advice. Thanks for breaking that down, Ellery. And if you're not for... I know that really didn't tell you much, but that's just, for me, a, a chance to transition here. We're going to take a look now. Um, city question one. Should ordinance ROD 18-39, I'm reading the actual ballot question, entitled Residential Coordinated Collection, remain in effect for residential trash collection in St. Paul? Ordinance 18-39 creates new rules for the collection and disposal of trash and payment for trash service and requires that certain residential dwellings have trash collected by a designated trash hauler. A yes vote is a vote in favor of keeping Ordinance ORD 18-39. A no vote is a vote to get rid of Ordinance ORD 1839. With 95% of the, of the precincts in the City of St. Paul reporting, 34,174 votes in favor of keeping the ordinance at 62.53 percent. There are 20,475 who are opposed. That would be 37.47. So that is what happened. The St. Paul uh, ordinance is still in effect. That means consolidated trash haulers. Uh, Melvin Carter gets his way on the issue. Those who want to be able to have their uh, more say into uh, which trash hauler they want to contract with, which ones, uh, and, and for trash haulers to be able to, you know, select their own turf and work for their own customers and be able to set their own prices. That's all gone. It's all done by city contract now. The ordinance has spoken, the voters have spoken, but I will have to say this, the voters spoken. I may not agree with their decision, but I am just glad to know that at least the voters had a chance to say in the matter. That should be the end of the matter for now anyway. In the meantime, for City of St. Paul, how did the City Council election results go? Remember the City of St. Paul has ranked choice voting which means, in a nutshell, it eliminates the primary. You don't have a primary election. And if a candidate does not achieve 50% on the first ballot, then there are successive rounds of balloting until a candidate goes over 50%. I'm not going to get in every single rule because I know there's certain people have to drop out and certain things happen certain ways. Uh, I'm not going to get into how a ranked choice ballot works other than to say that if you do not meet 50% in the first, first ballot, then it goes to a second choice or a third choice. Usually by the time we get to three ballots, 50% has been reached by somebody. Uh, at least that's historically been the case in the last, what, 10 years that this has been a thing. So of the seven wards in the city of St. Paul, five of them have reached the 50% threshold. There is not going to be any second uh, ballots. In St. Paul's Ward 1, uh, Dai, Dai Tao has uh, been leading at 42.29% with 2797 votes. And that will, of course, go to a second choice. That has not been done yet. Uh, Rebecca Necker took Ward 2 with 61.92%. That's 5,030 votes. Ward 3 is another one. Chris Tolbert, he took that one, 60.55% for 8,015. St. Paul City Council member Ward 4 is uh, Mitra Jalali Nelson, 59.13%, 5,896 in the vote. Ward 5 went to Amy Brendamone, 53.21%. That's 3,129 votes. And Ward
Ward 6. That's another one that's going to come down to another, uh, another choice. Uh, Nelsey Yang was leading 44.36%. Uh, and then in Ward 7, Jane Prince took that one with 61.69%, 28.31. And really, at least of the five who were selected, uh, the Ask Me endorsed candidates all won their elections. And of course, I'm not including the two that are still up for grabs. That's pretty much your St. Paul City Council race. The uh, Ask Me endorsed candidates won the St. Paul School Board races, I do believe. Nothing there. Uh, the Democrats, once again, run the city of St. Paul. The Republicans didn't even show up. No surprise there either. So in the city of St. Paul elections, there were really no surprises. Now, the... Um, and no real choices. And there were no choices either. Uh, it's pretty much what the unions want or nothing at all. We did have one county commissioner race uh, that we were watching in Ramsey County. That is Ramsey County Commissioner District Number 1 on the northern uh, county suburbs uh, like Shoreview, Arden Hills, uh, White Bear Township. And in that race, it was contested. Uh, Democrat, Nicole, even though it's nonpartisan, the parties do still endorse and they back candidates. So this is really a partisan race under a nonpartisan banner. Really, every election is kind of that way. Uh, Nicole Joy Fretham, the Democrat, uh, she won 52.45% to the Republican Randy Jessup at 47.14. So the vote totals were 83.72 versus 75.29. Hotly contested race in the northern suburbs. That one came down to turnout. Both parties were actively engaged in turning out their people. It just in this case happened to have been that more Democrats turned out than Republicans did in a election year that Republicans typically don't show up in. And therefore, Nicole Joy Fretham defeated Randy Jessup. I have to say congratulations to all candidates who, even those I did not mention, who put their name on the ballot. I'm a former candidate from like 25 years ago. I ran in one race. I came in eighth out of nine. I learned a lot. That's the reason I ran. I knew it was a crowded field for school board. I didn't run to win. But it's a rewarding experience nonetheless, just to go through the process once. And so my hat's off to everybody who took the time to uh, pay a filing fee, to do some form of campaign work, to put yourself out there. Uh, congratulations once again, even if you did not win your respective election. Now we're going to flip to the next kind of topic as we've covered uh, Minnesota and St. Paul elections and Ramsey County elections. And remember how I mentioned that that Prager University segment about uh, pensions is going to come back again. Well, it's happening in Kentucky. The narrative right now, because con the Democrats fared well in Kentucky and Virginia, and the narrative is that Trump's in trouble because the Democrats were winning in red states. That's, that's the narrative. That's what we hear today. I heard it on the news. I heard it on, you know, CBS. They were telling me, hey, Democrats are having a blue wave without saying blue wave. Trump's in trouble. What does this have for 2020? You know what happens in Kentucky? It's all about pensions. It's what it's all about. The governor's race in Kentucky is about pensions. And it has been about pensions for many, many, many years. We will not hear that from CBS at the national level. We'll hear that a little bit from maybe PBS because they do get down a little bit more in depth. We will not hear this from NBC. We will not hear this from CNN. Kentucky's governor's race was about pensions, period. Now, let's show you. So the first thing we're going to do is actually take a look at a PBS clip on why pro-Trump Kentucky is facing such a competitive governor's race. There are three major governor's races underway right now. Each offers a critical early test of Republican strength in advance of the 2020 presidential election. One of those races is tomorrow in Kentucky, where President Trump tonight is campaigning for the incumbent, Matt Bevin. William Brangham went to the Bluegrass State this weekend to see what's motivating voters in this very tight race. Well, hello, Kentucky! 
Ahead of the president's arrival, the vice president kicked off the final few days of the campaign, rallying supporters in rural Kentucky. Once we reelect Governor Matt Bevin for four more years, we can make it clear we're going to reelect President Donald Trump for four more years. The fact that President Trump and Vice President Pence felt the need to come here to rally supporters to Kentucky, a state that Donald Trump won by 30 points in the last election, that is not a good sign for the GOP in this state. The incumbent, Republican Matt Bevin, is in a neck-and-neck -neck race with this man, Kentucky's Attorney General, Democrat Andy Beshear. But at Friday's rally with the vice president and elsewhere, we heard a lot of confidence that Governor Bevin will win. I support him wholeheartedly. I like his character. I like what he stands for. And I like the platform. You're promising things for which you have zero plan I'm to actually come up with the money. And leadership. You have Where none of the above. The latest polling shows Bevan and Bashir in a virtual dead heat, which has turned this into a nasty and expensive campaign. Socialists in Washington want to impeach Trump. Ads supporting Bevan routinely link Bashir to events back in Washington, D.C. Send the socialists a message. Defeat Andy Bashir. We treat everyone with respect. Bashir ads, on the other hand, tend to focus almost entirely on local issues. He's tried to rip health care away from our families, and he's cutting public education. We can't take four more years. There's a few reasons why this race is so tight. One, Andy Bashir has strong name recognition. His dad, Steve Bashir, was Kentucky's last governor. But Governor Bevin has also hurt himself with some key groups in Kentucky. In 2018, teachers protested education and pension funding. Governor Bevin suggested that with schools closed because of the walkout, some children risked being sexually assaulted. He also called protesting teachers selfish and ignorant. It's all made Bevin one of the most unpopular incumbents in the nation. But this is about making sure they show up on Tuesday. It's driven many teachers and other state employees to work hard to unseat Bevin. This gathering, largely made up of educators in the Lexington area, were getting ready to canvas voters for Andy Bashir. They are trying to make it look like that, you know, Andy is a socialist. Let me tell you, if you can find a socialist, a full, like, through the core socialist in the state of Kentucky, I will kiss your hind end. These volunteers, mostly Democrats, but also a few Republicans, said there was a host of issues on their minds, ranging from clean water to corporate money and politics. Claire Batt is a Democrat. Denise Finley has been a lifelong Republican. Both are retired school teachers and longtime friends. And they spent much of Saturday trying to remind likely Bashir voters to turn out on Tuesday. So you and your wife are both planning to vote? Oh, yeah. What do you guys think of is most at stake in this election? Our children. Our children are I'm not sure about the education of our children. Both women say that if this race is fought on local issues, Bashir will win. But they worry that the enormously popular President Trump and the impeachment battle will energize Republicans to show up in droves for Bevin. If you could have told the Democratic Party in Washington, D.C., would you have liked them to say, hold off on this impeachment stuff for another week, let us have an election without stoking the fires? Um, <laughs> in a sense, yes. Uh, and I, I sort of hate to say that because I think they have to follow the the, that investigation. the investigation and how it unrolls. I think it really has caused issues for us here in Kentucky um, because they use it. And that's why Trump is coming, too. Some Republicans, like Mark Williams, a veteran and retired firefighter, agree that impeachment will fire up voters, but on both sides. I see it as a political scam. The, the impeachment process. The impeachment process, yes. Uh, I think it's just a way to try to sway voters in 2020. So do you think that that's going to have any impact on people's votes here? Or oh, I think it will, yes. Yes, uh, especially you know, we're, the whole United States is sort of divided right now. And uh, I, I think it will help give fuel to the other fire. Williams has one of his neighborhood's only Matt Bevin signs in his front yard. He likes the governor and President Trump for a trait they both share. I think more politicians should go with straight talk, simply because you can understand Matt Bevin. 
he'll he'll tell you what he wants and how he wants it. Uh, you don't have to follow a riddle to get to the answer. For Republicans, this race will test whether the president's popularity, combined with outrage over impeachment, is enough to push an unpopular incumbent across the finish line. For Democrats, they say this race is the ultimate test. If they can't win the state house under these conditions, it spells serious trouble for the party in 2020. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm William Brangham in Kentucky. So now that begs the question, why are the teachers mad at Matt Bevan? Why? Why is Matt Bevan unpopular in his home state? Are there reasons that Matt Bevan might not be generating the type of support that he would normally get as a governor running for re-election? What is wrong with Matt Bevan? Let's take a quick look at Matt Bevan's background. I'm not going to talk about his business background and all that, his political background. First of all, on the Republican side, in 2015, actually not 15, uh, 14, the last time the current U.S. Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, was up for re-election, Matt Bevan ran a primary challenge against Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, love him or hate him, I kind of love, love him at times and I hate him at times. And I've long since said that Mitch McConnell should actually start looking at retirement. I think he really needed to look at retirement about 20 years ago. That's just me. I'm not a big fan of Mitch McConnell. But at the same time, when you have somebody who has as much power in the state as Mitch McConnell has in Kentucky, it's almost a political death knell if you are going to run a primary challenge against him. That's what Matt Bevan did in 2014. Matt Bevan came up with 35.4% of the vote against Mitch McConnell. Shauna Sterling had 2%, Chris Payne had 1.5%, and Brad Kopas had 0.9%. Matt Bevan had a very strong showing, 125,787 votes against Mitch McConnell in 2014. It's incredible. Now with that, what he was able to do, even though we lost, he then kind of played nice with Mitch McConnell. And he ran for the governorship of Kentucky in 2015. Now, he had a very contentious primary on his hand then, and that was almost lost. Matt Bevan and uh, Janine Hampton just narrowly beat out James Comer and Chris McDaniel. This is Governor, Lieutenant Governor. Each of them had 32.9%. Matt Bevan had 70,479. James Comer had 70,396. 83 votes separated the winner and the loser. That was 2015 primary. So here you've already upset the Senate Majority Leader, and then you win by less than 500 votes, a contentious primary, and then it comes down to the general election, and Matt Bevan won 52.5 to 43.8. So that was a pretty sound defeat in 2015. But then what did he do? He went after the pension crisis to actually fix a problem. Now, on the Republican side, you've all, he's already alienated supporters. I know people in Kentucky in that election in 2015 where they held their nose. Like, ah, you know, I don't like Matt Bevan, but I don't like Jack Conway, the Democrat, either. And so I'm going to hold my nose. I'm going to vote for Matt Bevan. I'd prefer having somebody else, but Matt Bevan, Matt Bevan is the guy. That's how they voted in 2015. So already his popularity rating was kind of low for the top of the ticket, even within his own party. And so then, here we are. It's his re-election, and it's very, very close. So now, let's take a look at the pension system. Well, we've got two sections here. Um, one is from the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, which is an ad. It's um, 
the pension system is bankrupt in Kentucky. And then another one is uh, a clip from a, I think the state Senate majority leader, uh, one of the politicians in Kentucky talking about pension boards and who is responsible for the uh, debt in the pension crisis. Let's take a look at both back to back. That's the sound of Kentucky's public pension fund bankrupting our state. The cost to taxpayers is nearly $34 billion. Without action, that means every single man, woman, and child owes almost $8,000. It's even worse. Kentucky will be forced to take drastic actions, impacting our schools, our classrooms, and making college tuition even higher, slowing road construction to maintain and improve our county roads and highways, cutting vital resources for basic public safety like police, fire, and emergency services. But there's hope. Both Democrats and Republicans in Frankfurt have come together with Senate Bill 2 that will protect Kentucky families and taxpayers while honoring the promise to public employees and retirees. Call 800-372-7181. Tell Kentucky's legislators to do the right thing and pass Senate Bill 2 now. Paid for by the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce and the Kentucky League of Cities. The systems are broken. And I want each and every teacher who hears my voice to go out and say, wait a minute, if 15% of the problem, according to the PFM report, or 10% of the problem, according to the teacher retirement system report, is all that the funding mechanism is, is part of this, what happened to the other 85 to 90%? Who's asking the board and the KTRS system and the KERS system with Tommy Elliott and all the other individuals, what happened for all those years? Where did this go wrong? Why are you 80 to 85 to 90% of the problem? Why didn't you ask for statutory change? Those are the questions that really need to be asked because the first person, and I'm not going to sit here and, and in any way uh, defend because I know some things because the individual has not been in the private sector and people want to part has not been in the public sector and people want to parse Governor Bevin's statement and interpret them that's that's you know but people do that but the first person that's been willing in the executive branch to jump up and deal with this problem is the governor he's the first person that has really joined with the Senate and now the house to address a problem that's been festering for years that we've been talking about for years in the Senate. So for people to say, wait a minute, there's a problem, there is. But the biggest part of this problem is the systems themselves being over 80% responsible no matter who you want to listen to. And as my, sat, my dad used to tell me in trying a case, don't believe them, don't believe me. Look at the facts and look at the records. And that will tell you the story. Okay, so now I'm not going to get into the intricacies of the Kentucky pension system because it is really bad. But I'm going to read out of one story here, just some basic facts, just one little paragraph. By 2016, the cre credit rating, rating agency... Let me get that again. By 2016, the credit rating agency Standard & Poor's declared Kentucky's pension system the worst funded state pension system in the country. At that point, the state was meeting only 37.4% of its funding obligation, half the national median of 74.6. And essentially, and I'm, again, I'll pro probably dig into this on in a future uh, show because it's quite complicated, but there is uh, something in, in uh, Kentucky called Arrowhawk. Arrowhawk was a investment uh, platform, uh, like a, a fund, whose first investor was the Kentucky Retirement Systems, KRS in that previous clip. And it was made by hedge funds. Now, I've gone against hedge funds on this show before. I've talked about hedge funds who bankrupted Sears, bankrupted Toys R Us, bankrupted Herbergers, just bankrupted retail in general. Hedge funds and their roles in other uh, liquidity and bankruptcy proceedings. The hedge funds are bankrupting America, and the hedge funds essentially have bankrupted the Kentucky pension retirement system. They have. 
they were paying the politicians. Hey, remember that Prager University clip that I played earlier about how they'll pay this, you know, to get these people in who will turn around and pass this bill to benefit these people? The hedge funds were doing that with the Democrats in the state of Kentucky. And who had his fingerprints over that? Kentucky's last governor prior to Matt Bevan, and that was Steve Bashirs. Wow. Where'd that name Bashir come from? Oh, Steve Bashir's son is Andy Bashir, who is the one who is running against Matt Bevan, who also is the same Andy Bashir who was the Attorney General for the state of Kentucky. And here in a nutshell is what happened. Matt Bevan took on the problem head on. That would result in some changes. Now, the unions do not like changes, especially when it comes to their pension system and their gravy train of uh, benefits. And Matt Bevan had a bipartisan commission, Republicans and Democrats, to propose solutions. They took those solutions and, and crafted legislation that got passed by both houses, the state senate, the state house, and it was signed by the governor. Pension crisis should be over, right? You would think. But the attorney general, Andy Bashirs files a lawsuit on behalf of the state of Kentucky. He had the jurisdiction to do that. The Supreme Court for Kentucky overturns the bill, and here we are with no pension fix. The system's still broken. The fix was thrown out in the court of law. And now the teachers' unions are seeking their revenge. The unions are seeking their revenge. And kind of remember, St. Paul, the unions run St. Paul. Well, the unions kind of run the Democrats in Kentucky, too. And so here we have Andy Bashirs, the former attorney general, son of the previous governor before Matt uh, Bevan, running against Matt Bevan, the same guy who, who became governor, who ran against Mitch McConnell. Why is Matt Bevan's approval rating in the mid-30s? Oh, part of it, Matt Bevan did bring that on himself. Well, here is where we sit on, uh, um, on the unofficial results in the state of Kentucky for their governor's race. Matt Bevan has 704,388 votes, 48.83 percent. Andy Bashir has 709,577 votes, that's 49.19. The Libertarian John Hicks, 28,425 for 1.97. And yes, the Libertarian Party wanted to become the spoiler and they became the spoiler. And they're proud of their role as being a spoiler. And the difference between Bashir and Bevan is 5,189 votes out of 1.442 million votes cast. Now tell me how this is a big referendum on Trump when you have a lot of internal turmoil going on in the state of Kentucky, some warranted by uh, Bevan, some caused by the Bashir family. And Bevan and Bashir are the two main candidates running for governor. I think that has a lot more to do with it than any referendum on Trump's policies. And let's take a look. How did things go? I just told you the results. Let's see what uh, the governor has to say about it. Would it, be, would it be a Bevin race if it wasn't a squeaker? I mean, come on. I mean, really and truly, this is a close, close race. We are not conceding this race by any stretch. Not at all. Whoever your next governor is, and we truly don't know right now, we don't, but whoever it is will be the one determined by the process being followed, by the law being followed, by the process being truly sound, and if in fact it is, whoever that governor is will have responsibility to keep this trajectory moving forward. And I will say this, I will be the first one in line wishing well to my opponent if he ends up as our next governor. Because guess what? We live here too. And it affects us, it affects our lives, it affects our livelihoods. I would hope to a person, everyone in here, wants Kentucky to be the greatest version of itself possible. I really hope so. So that's where we're at. Matt Bevan has not conceded. It's probably going to go to a recount. Hey, in Minnesota, you kind of remember Coleman Franken in 2008? Yeah. That's going to happen in Kentucky. But now what happened about other races? Again, this is supposed to be a referendum on Trump according to the mainstream media. 
Oh, Matt Bevin's losing. It's probably Bashir is going to be the, uh, the Democrats winning the gubernatorial race in Kentucky. Trump's in trouble. What about Secretary of State? Oh, uh, Republican Michael G. Adams, 52.26%. Attorney General uh, Daniel Cameron, 57.75%. Republican. The Auditor of Public Accounts, Mike Herman, 55.65%. Republican. State Treasurer, Allison Ball, Republican, 60.66%. Commissioner of Agriculture, Ryan Quarles, 58.21%. And uh, now we start getting into the judges and other... Okay, actually, there's a couple of uh, legislative races, too. So, uh, uh, Samara Heverin, 60.29, Republican, uh, State Representative of the 18th uh, Representative District. Uh, state representative in the 63rd district, Kim Banta, Republican, 63.11. And now we have the judges, which are different races, so I'm not even going to get into all that. The fact is, the only thing that the Democrats picked up out of Kentucky was the governor, and they may not have even done that. How is this a referendum on Donald J. Trump? It is not. Don't listen to the mainstream media. Now, we're going to go on one more area, uh, and I'm just going to tell you what's going on. Um, because 10 years ago, I actually ran a campaign for the House of Delegates in one of the districts in the state of Virginia. That a friend of a friend brought me out there, and I served as the campaign manager. My can it was too late for me to really be able to do the things that we needed to do to win, and my candidate wasn't exactly listening too well. Did some of the stuff, didn't do all the stuff. Long, complicated story, but I'll tell you this. I learned a lot about Virginia elections. Because the other narrative you hear right now is, oh, Trump's in trouble because the legislature in the state of Virginia flipped for the first time in 25 years from red to blue. The Democrats now control Virginia. Guess what, folks? Ten years ago, the Democrats were trying everything they can and throwing everything they can to flip Virginia. And you had some major players in Virginia throwing a lot of money. Michael Bloomberg, George Soros, just to name two well-known ones. After the last redistricting, now mind you, I was there in 2009, so this was before all of this stuff happened. 2009, uh, 2011, you had redistricting that came out, and it was a court challenge. There's court challenges to redistricting all across the board. It happens almost everywhere. Surprisingly, Minnesota really doesn't have that much in the way of uh, court challenges. Simple reason is usually it, it's the, the, our legislature often gets a lot of input from judges, and so it withstands a lot of those challenges. But in Virginia, it was challenged, and it was brought all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, oh, no, that's gerrymandering. We're not. Well, actually, the Supreme Court didn't say that. A lower court said, oh, that's gerrymandering. You have to change your districts. So what happened? They changed it from Republican favor to Democrat favor. And in 2018, that was the first time that the new congressional districts were uh, drawn. And you know what? The Democrats actually picked up some uh, seats in, uh, in Congress. But now, of course, this is the first legislative election. While it was being appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, guess what happened? The Supreme Court said, oh, the Republicans in the state legislature didn't have the uh, legal standing to be able to push this. It was supposed to be the Attorney General. The Attorney General is a Democrat who didn't push the issue. Therefore, the Supreme Court said the lower decision has to stand. So now we're in the first election where uh, we had new uh, boundaries that were drawn in the state of Virginia, the boundaries that were favoring Democrats, and guess what? The Democrats won. And they flipped the seats, but they didn't do it necessarily through winning elections without the help of courts to gerrymander in their favor. What does Donald Trump have to do with gerrymandering and legislative boundaries in the state of Virginia based upon a map that was in 2011? Absolutely nothing. What we are seeing is the ramification of a decade-long process, really in both Kentucky and Virginia, of a process that's favoring Democrats, and oftentimes problems caused by Democrats. And the Democrats are finally reaping the rewards of their decade-long investment in two states that are considered to be bellwethers for a general election. Folks, this has nothing to do with Trump in 2020, and in everywhere else, the Republicans have won in 2018. Uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2019. Anyhow, that's it for now. Jeff Williams, North Star Oasis, Dallas producer. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.
build a mountain, gonna build it high. 